So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this next session, uh, which is Agritech, Sustainable Coal Chains and Doubling Farmers' Incomes. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Robin Mason. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Birmingham, uh, and I'll be chairing this session uh, along with uh, four experts who I'll be introducing uh, in a short while. Prime Minister Modi has set uh, India the target of doubling farmers' incomes by 2022. Upwards of 40% of food is lost between the farm gate and market, which reduces farmers' income, their capacity to invest, their incentive to grow more food, and it impacts on the cost of food in the rapidly urbanizing marketplace. The Government of India has identified investment in coal chain logistics to mitigate post-harvest losses and enable fast connectivity with markets as a vital component in its seven-point farm income strategy. The aim is for the coal chain to be an integrated, seamless and resilient network of refrigerated and temperature controlled pack houses, cold storage, distribution hubs and vehicles used to maintain the safety, quality and quantity of food produce while moving it swiftly from point of harvest to consumption point with minimal environmental and natural resource impact. Uh, in contrast, conventional diesel powered transport, uh, refrigeration units and pack houses involve high levels of waste and also high levels of CO2, nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. So, it's vital that any new coal chain infrastructure should be efficient, minimizing waste, and clean, preferably zero emission and powered by renewable energy. And getting all of this right will enhance economic wealth, cash flow, and security for farmers, growers, and fishers, improve food quality, safety, and value to the consumer, and achieve all of that sustainably. Now, clean coal is an area of particular strength for the UK in terms of fundamental academic research, the technology and equipment required to generate coal energy, policy analysis and development, and the development of new business models. And it's a priority area for my own institution, the University of Birmingham, where our Energy Institute is leading on the development of sustainable and efficient energy systems and policy. Experts at Birmingham are working with colleagues from MPN Systems and the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation and with three states in India to understand the state, the current state of coal chain in India and how to ensure the transition to a coal chain with minimal environmental impact. Uh, and we think it's a great example of where shared expertise and knowledge and technology transfer between the UK and India can address an issue of critical importance to both our countries. So I'm particularly delighted to be joined uh, at this session by some key individuals involved in the work. Powernex Kohli leads the National Center for Coal Chain Development where he is the Chief Executive Officer. NCCD is an autonomous advisory body of the Government of India. Powernex has over 30 years of experience in international shipping, free trade zones, multimodal logistics and public policy. He's a member of the Committee for Doubling Farmers' Income, an empowered steering committee for implementation of the Montreal Protocol. He has represented India on global platforms and as a keynote speaker at various forums. The guidelines and minimum system standards for India's coal chain development program are authored under his tutelage. Uh, in addition to all of that, he is an honorary professor at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Mahesh Patanka is managing director of MPN Systems. He has over 25 years of experience in the energy and environmental fields. He's an international energy policy expert, having worked with USAID, the World Bank, the US Department of the Environment, ADB and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Mahesh has worked extensively on resource conservation projects spanning energy, water, transportation sectors in India, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. He holds a PhD from IIT Bombay and a Master's in Financial Management from Mumbai University. 
He's also a certified measurement and verification professional. Dr. Raya al Dadas is a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham in thermofluids within our Department of Mechanical Engineering, having previously undertaken a, a B.Eng. in Palestine and received a PhD from London South Bank. She has researched and supervised research projects in the field of heat transfer and refrigeration and published over 30 papers in reputable journals and international conferences. And hopefully, very shortly, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Arjun Singh Sayani, Director General of the Department of Horticulture, the Government of Haryana, and Managing Director of Small Farmers Agribusiness Consortium. Dr. Sayani is responsible for carrying out horticultural extension activities of the Haryana government. He leads program and policies related to production and maintenance of fruits, vegetables, flowers, spices, mushrooms, medicinal and aromatic plants in the state. As managing director of SFAC, he supports farmers groups that aim at value addition and aggregation of produce to get remunerative prices through backward and forward integration. He's also credited with development of post-harvest management infrastructure in Haryana with more than 80 million US dollars of investment. He's the front leader in establishing five centers of excellence in fruits, vegetables, beekeeping and flowers in collaboration with foreign countries. He holds a PhD in horticultural sciences and has traveled widely. So I think with such a, an excellent panel of experts, I'm sure nobody will be leaving the session early, but should you have to for any reason, uh, could I just remind you please to return your headphones there. Don't switch them off, uh, just return them, but I'm sure you'll all be uh, rooted to, to the spot for the rest of the session. So with that, it's a great pleasure first to ask uh, Professor Coley if he could uh, introduce his thoughts on the topic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sustainable cold chains are uh, obviously linked with uh, one aspect of agriculture, the perishable outputs from uh, our farming system. Uh, farming itself, agriculture itself, if you, if you think about it, is uh, solar powered. It's the world's first solar powered factory. These enterprises look at soil, uh, effort, toil, uh, uh, some resources, water, seeds, uh, and rely on solar energy. Uh, so far, the agricultural system has been driven across the world, um, and quite so in India, by the concept of uh, production. In the morning session, and I see a lot of the participants in the morning and uh, attendees from the morning here, uh, there was a lot of talk about how we can produce more efficiently, uh, precision farming, robotics, um, better chemicals, systems, fertilizers, all, all to do with improving on our output, on our yields. Uh, to what avail is what this session, or what I would like to speak of in this session. You produce for an end purpose, an end aim in mind. And that production is for, in case of foods, for consumption. In case of when you're producing something for industries, as feedstock for the industry. Uh, when we talk about food wastage, we must one differentiate between food loss and food waste. Food loss is what happens uh, post-production, en route to destination markets. Uh, and food waste is what happens post-monetization in the hands of consumers. Wastage is countered by uh, mindset changes and food loss is where, is where technologies step in. Any food loss happening in the supply chain is, uh, is a black mark uh, on uh, technology providers and technology users. Now, food loss by and large happens because whatever you do produce, you utilize technologies only to hold it and not focus on delivering it, which was fine when we spoke about food security because food was scarce, consumers uh, uh, were a source of high demand, and a push model was possible. Hence, the Green Revolution across the world, India too. The Green Revolution was based on pushing production so that there was more available because demand was uh, facing a shortfall. Across the world, like all revolutions, the Green Revolution is done with. 
It's a horse that we keep flogging today. It's about another revolution, which is about making sure it's delivery oriented. That's where cold chains step in for perishables. Uh, cold chains in, in India were largely thought of as one specific technology, refrigeration, for the purpose of holding goods, pending and waiting for uh, demand to resurface, little realizing that the real value out of cold chains or any logistics is about cross-geographical arbitrage, is about cross-geographical connections, and not time-based arbitrage, which is hoarding. Uh, this is the way that cold chain development is now being driven in India, utilizing cold chain technologies so that production is connected and communicated to markets, value as produced is communicated to where value is best realized. Um, it's also important to understand uh, there are other aspects to it. I'm talking about on, on a broad general level. There are five or seven crop types of uh, production out of uh, agriculture which can be held for long periods. Uh, but by and large, more than 95% of what we produce needs to connect with consumers. If we think technology intervention means uh, buying time and we waste that time while holding on to goods, uh, that, is, that is no real intervention. Uh, interventions must disrupt the way we transact the way we handle our outputs uh, and a cold chain is one key aspect uh, which is going to change the way India manages its food output and how India can connect with other uh, countries, nations and cross, across geographies. Uh, an important part about uh, when we speak about mindset changes is when we look at agriculture not just as a mere act of cultivation serfs working on land as a, uh, as a matter of livelihood, but as driving them as enterprises, that means that uh, agriculture too can no longer be supply driven, but has to be market led, to be demand driven. We've always heard of the phrase from farm to fork, but it's about time with today's technology, we're looking at future tech, where we look at the fork to farm approach, how we produce for what is in demand. It's not to be driven by subsidies alone. It is to be driven by real demand. In the morning, we heard somebody says, we have something out of peanut butter, but people don't like it. The answer is very obvious. Either you convince people of the uh, values of what you're providing, or you change your product. So it has to be demand driven. And if it's demand driven, if you have a folk to farm approach, then your entire technology application is to do about reaching that demand and not holding and waiting for demand to reach you. We find various technologies around in the world and various business models and systems that can be deployed in uh, taking agriculture forward in India. But we find a major bottleneck being mindset changes in the minds of developers in the minds of end users, in the minds of farmers. Extension services were again spoken of in the morning session in, in, uh, on agriculture is very important. That's where we find collaboration with, uh, say, University of Birmingham, where extension is not about listening to somebody like me speak. Extension really makes so much more sense when you have demonstration happening on field. So the concept of living labs, where both technology providers, technology users, and those who hope to do, derive economic value out of those can actually visit, uh, see, and partake in those living labs. A, uh, that's one aspect uh, uh, I enjoy personally a lot working with the University of Birmingham. Uh, this whole uh, agenda of this, this uh, festival is collaboration. I would like all of you to look at Cold Chain as the ultimate in collaboration in the agricultural system. It has to collaborate with the cultivator. It has to collaborate, that's the production phase. It has to collaborate at the post-production phase across a multiple of value chain actors, technology providers, service providers, because cold chain is that system which makes sure that farming is productive and the output of farms comes to gainful end use. So I'll close, I've finished off my eight minutes. Uh, it's about, uh, forget the green revolution now, look at an income revolution, because an income revolution will make sense out of everything. An income revolution will also make sure everything remains sustainable. Thank you.
Ponex, thank you very much. And uh, you've s set an example for the, the rest of the speakers. You were perfectly on eight minutes. So uh, with that, I wonder if I can ask Mahesh to, uh, to speak next. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Professor Mason, uh, Professor Kohli, and my fellow panelists. Uh, and thank you all for being a part of this panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, build on what uh, uh, Mr. Kohli talked about uh, in terms of what's the next revolution. So, and uh, here I would like to uh, draw. Okay, here I would like to draw some uh, 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 parallels with uh, what India is best known for, uh, which is the milk revolution. So, uh, if you go down to the concept of uh, whatever that India has done so far is by the people and for the people. I think it's important for us to understand different types of business propositions where those who would end up uh, benefiting from all of this are directly involved in those business cases. So, uh, one of the things that we have done along with the University of Birmingham uh, is to explore the social entrepreneurships uh, in different fields in a few states. And these states include uh, states like Haryana, Maharashtra, Karnataka, where we have reached out to several farmers, former producer organizations, former producer companies, as well as different cooperatives that exist in different types of food value chains, including sugarcane, milk, so and so forth. Uh, one of the key uh, aspects that we have seen in this particular exploration is the fact that there is a lot of uh, hunger to get into the entrepreneurship model in the social strata. So if you look at, uh, say, for example, a farmer producer company working out of Mumbai uh, or Maharashtra, uh, it's actually very interesting to see that they are in a position to uh, influence the input as well as the output coming from those particular uh, units. And here, uh, I would like to give a few examples. So this is an example from Maharashtra, where you have uh, around 4,000 to 5,000 farmers coming together uh, and forming some kind of a farmer producer company and making sure that uh, there is no uh, loss that happens uh, whenever they get uh, their produce from the farm to uh, the fork. Uh, what's interesting is the fact that uh, all of their efforts related to convening and aggregating uh, either the input demand or, or the supply that they can push out into the marketplace has yielded uh, uh, in a lot of uh, value creation by all of them. And obviously there is sort of a real role to play uh, from the technology side of things. I'm not going to dwell a lot on the cold chain and the components of the cold chain technologies that will be dealt with by uh, other fellow panelists. But what's most important and interesting here uh, is to share with you the applications of IT and mobile technologies. So here we are looking at certain propositions where based on the market demand, uh, the harvesting time uh, and the sellable uh, life of any kind of produce can be extended by the farmers right from uh, the uh, uh, a trigger coming from the fork side, but going right up to uh, the farm side. So there, are, there is a very interesting proposition where several agribusinesses can emerge if they can take the advantage of IT and mobile enabled techniques to send those triggers to the farm level, uh, starting right from the, uh, from the fork. So there are several examples uh, of such uh, uh, triggers available, and uh, we closely looked at the IT technologies, what, kinds of, uh, what are the kinds of IT technologies that are available for anyone to uh, use uh, in this particular business propositions. Uh, we also had the opportunity to uh, talk to quite a few investor community, and the investors certainly have higher level of appetite uh, to invest into uh, some such structures. So uh, I would sort of uh, uh, stop there. would we'll be glad to answer any specific questions that uh, the audience would have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mahesh. So um, uh, we'll have uh, ample time at the end, of course, for questions and answers. So uh, um, start formulating your, your, your questions now. If I can hand over to, to Raya to talk a little bit more about uh, particularly the technologies that we're working on at the University of Birmingham. Okay, uh, the technologies that we are using in the University of Birmingham, they are all dependent on available resources of energy that are green and have zero emissions, renewable type of energy. 
starting from the first technology that the University of Birmingham is working with IT Mo Bombay on is the development of a cryogenic based uh, transport refrigeration units. These are for the transport of food from one place to the other, the agricultural food from one place to the other. This, uh, in, in, in India particularly, there is about four and a half thousand tons of liquid nitrogen available at various locations in India. This can be used to drive a new technology that has been invented in the UK to drive it refrigeration transport units. And obviously, using nitrogen, then the emissions coming out from these units are zero emissions. In a sense, it's mainly nitrogen. So no pollution coming out of it. So these units will uh, replace the diesel engines that are commonly unregulated and contribute to large amount of NOx emissions and particulate. This is one technology. The other technologies that we are working on is to again utilize thermal energy sources, being solar energy that's abundant in India, uh, waste heat sources, uh, any uh, Thermal energy sources that's available can be used to drive these systems. These are known as the sorption technology. We are working on adsorption systems using advanced material that have the three times or four times the capability of currently existing ones. They can be producing cooling uh, to drive uh, refrigeration units for uh, storing or even can be incorporated also in transport technologies. Uh, the other third uh, resources, which is again available in the agriculture, particularly, there is a huge amount of waste being the straws of uh, wheat, rice, all sorts of plants that die and stay overground and generate more pollution. This waste can be converted into various types of energy, whether this energy in a form of solid pellets that can be used for heating or cooking. They can also be used to generate syngas that can be used to drive engines, producing electricity. Again, waste thermal energy can be used to drive sorption technology, which can be used to produce cooling and uh, water if need to be. Uh, for de delivering um, desalinated water. Uh, so these technologies are there. For solar technology, while the uh, silicon-based photovoltaic cells are commonly used now, but there are now advanced solar cells uh, relying on multi-junction cells with efficiencies reaching over 40%. These cells work on a concentrated level of solar radiation, reaching 1,000 times the sun. And with this level of intensified solar energy falling on small areas, you can generate the electricity at high efficiency, the 40%. But you can also generate thermal energy that can be used to drive sorption technology again. So all of these relying on resources that are either waste and not being used, or solar uh, systems, that's uh, green technology and producing no emissions. So this will overcome, obviously, the uh, large usage of vapor compression systems that's currently used here, driven by diesel engines and sources that are uh, polluting to the environment. Yep. Um, yeah, factor in the book. Uh, Obviously, to spread the technologies that we are working on both uh, internationally and nationally, the University of Birmingham have developed uh, the concept of a factory in a box so that they can uh, spread the manufacturing of these uh, technologies worldwide at minimal cost without uh, a huge investment. Okay. Thank you. Rea, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers on some of the technologies that you covered there. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Saini, great pleasure that you're able to, to, to join us. We, I introduced you previously, so I, if it's all right, I'll just hand over to you now to say a few words, um, your thoughts on 
cold chain and farmers income thank you very much okay mm, thank you professor robin it's okay uh, thank you professor robin and my fellow uh, panelist uh, actually the moment uh, we start talking about cold chain uh, it refers directly to in our mind the refrigeration and refrigeration means the produce especially for uh, milk products and the fish products but now our mindset has to be changed from cold chain to the supply chain i believe the cold chain is a part of supply chain and this is there this is where we need to work on this technology uh, india you know is a beautiful country with different climates and uh, cultures climatically what we can do is here uh, though we have summer winter everything uh, but in the same summer we had different seasonality of the fruits and vegetables uh, and we can target our market within india so in the first phase from supply of one produce from south of india to north of india and from north of india to south of india uh, that's where we do require the efficiency in supply chain and the cold storage as part of the supply chain that's the our requirement and in haryana you know in, uh, so close to delhi being close to delhi uh, we are targeting roughly around 55 million uh, population uh, as a consumer market and we do require efficient supply chain in haryana because we can reach this the biggest market here uh, within 2 uh, to 3 hours and this is the first phase of the development in the technology in uh, our type of uh, uh, this area secondly of course uh, uh, the the moment we start moving from one market to another market uh, and where there is a glut in the market and there is a produce which if we have to target the distant market of course then we do require a, a efficient cold chain systems because it serves uh, uh, along with the supply chain uh, do in haryana uh, we have a, we have uh, projected a very ambitious, uh, ambitious project on the supply chain and cold chain systems for roughly around 500 crore rupees and we identified different clusters in haryana and within that clusters we are targeting a building up of a integrated pack house systems which not only have the uh, supply chain components but also the cold chain components as well but to target the farmers, I am not talking about the big uh, retail outlet, uh, retail chains, but if we are targeting the farmers who are the ultimate supplier of the produce, we need to have uh, have sustainable technologies wh which are affordable at the farmers level. Uh, uh, like you know, uh, we have different issues with regard to the technologies, with regard to the availability of uh, electricity and with regard to the uh, the road connectivity within the interior of the uh, rural areas. Uh, in that case, we do require the newer technologies, which are renewable type of, like solar type systems, uh, which of course, Bringa University might be working on it. Uh, but we need to have some prototype of the technology uh, developed at that centers, at that uh, rural areas, where we can uh, further move to the distant market. That's all from our side. Thank you. Dr. Sani, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you've, you've heard from uh, a range of speakers uh, with, with different perspectives. I think some of the, the themes that I heard are that um, there are technologies that exist. Uh, of course, there's more and more innovation in uh, materials and methods, but there are technologies that exist. Uh, so often it's a question of how those technologies connect and how they're used, uh, and that therefore leads you into questions of how the whole system, um, uh, in the one direction from farm to fork, how the whole system connects. Uh, but we also heard questions of uh, the need to change mindset and behavior uh, to uh, adopt new technologies, but also new, new systems and new ways of working, uh, and to go back to the, the recasting that we heard right at the outset um, how do you reverse that and have a connection from fork to farm so that things are more market and demand driven as well as shaped by uh, supply side considerations? So a number of, a number of separate themes and questions. Uh, I've no doubt missed 
quite a few things there, so that'll be now up to you and the audience to, to fill in the gaps and ask any questions that you have of our panel. Uh, hi, myself, uh, Dr. Manish Patel, and uh, I represent uh, Incotech and uh, also the CRODA from UK. We are experts in seed technology. Now, uh, looking to the topics in the title where I have a problem, because you said the sustainable cold chain and doubling the farmer's income. And so far as I knew, uh, it's difficult for me to understand how cold chain is helping the farmers to double the income. Because basically, when you put up a cold chain or a supply chain, it's all about earning by the middle agencies, not to the farmers. And I don't know how many farmers are putting their produce in the coal rooms and you know they park there and they sell their produce when the price goes up. Basically, coal chains, to my understanding, is being used for stockists and the middle agencies and they are increasing their incomes, but not the farmers actually. So can I have justification from you? Thank you. Dr. Saini first. Yes. So, uh, as I have told, we have developed different clusters in Haryana and uh, we have around 400 such clusters in different locations. Uh, last three months, uh, continuously we have done a survey of different levels of the supply chain, right, starting from the farmers to the ultimate retail chain. Well, the current seasonality, in the current seasons, the cauliflower, you say for example, the, it sells around 400 rupees. The farmers sell a produce at 4 rupees a kg, and in the market is a 20 rupees a kg. Naturally, uh, the farmers uh, who have worked for four months, he's getting only four rupees, and within one or two days, all the other immediate midis, they're getting 15 rupees of that part. That's the issue. Now, how to develop that, how to increase that income? That is your question. Uh, we are developing the integrated pack houses systems right at the own farm systems, right at the farmer's field. We have uh, call it a cluster. Within that cluster, it's a three or four villages of one clusters. Uh, we'll develop a one integrated pack house. This may be a 50 lakh rupees, maybe a four crore or five crore rupees as well. And it will be managed by the farmers producer organizations and farmers associations. All the members of farmers associations, we believe once that come into picture, though we already, our project is uh, on, we are sanctioned around 20 such projects in Haryana and they may be developed within the next three, four months, there will be such projects in different locations. Uh, we are thinking mm, that the price right now which a farmer is getting around 4 rupees, that at least he may get around 7 to 8 rupees because we are eliminating a different uh, intermediaries in between. Right now what is happening is the dealer or uh, these commission agents, the farmers go into the mandi and everything works in the mandi itself. Now there are bigger uh, dealers who directly come into the farmer's field and they take the produce at whatever the price they want. Once these structures came, then the farmers have a holding capacity. Farmers can hold not only the produce, but they can determine the market also to an extent. I'm not saying it will be immediately to box. And by this way, what we are thinking that the farmer's income, not by the way of the increasing the production or productivity, but only by uh, managing the market, uh, they are able to increase their income to an extent and we are helping them, the farmers, to establishing such centers up to the 90%. If it's a 4 crore project, we are in investing around 90% and all the packages will be built by the farmers. I think this may satisfy you. Thank you. Dr. Sani, thank you. Uh, Mahesh, I, I, I wonder whether some of your experience maybe in Maharashtra or elsewhere could, could speak. I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent challenge, which is that you can put in place new technology and new systems, but unless the economic and the business model changes, then farmers may not benefit. It'll be intermediate agents that might uh, capture the value that's been been created. Is there anything yeah, from your so, experience? Sure. So uh, to quickly add here, um, there are examples of the farmer producer companies coming together and doing deals with the large formats, such as Future Group, uh, Jane Farms, Godrej, Nature's Basket, so on and so forth. So, what you're doing in that process is eliminating the entire middleman structure. So that's how sort of uh, you would increase the income of the farmers. Uh, Dr. Sen has already covered a few things that Haryana is doing, but there are nothing less than 
uh, 50 pharma producer companies who are working in pomegranate, uh, uh, vegetables and fruits, different types, uh, where they are aggregating the supply and then pushing it in the market by directly doing deals uh, with the off-takers. So I hope that clarifies as well. Your question is about the transaction model, right? Now, if technology is used, and you, in your question itself, you mentioned cold rooms, and if the technology is only about holding on to goods and not changing the way you transact, then yes, what you say is true. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, last year, farmers were throwing tomatoes at four rupees. Uh, that's about 10p or even less, 5p, yeah, uh, in Bangalore. And at the same time in Delhi, Tomatoes were sold at wholesale market for 35 to 40 rupees. The price wedge was 10 times, 1,000%. All that was needed was to pack those tomatoes. Since the travel time on trucks was about seven days, tomatoes wouldn't last more than three or four days without any cooling. Hence, the technology intervention in terms of refrigeration, packaging. Move to Delhi, not wait for the market to develop nearby. Connect with a ready market. So now the advantages are one. As a, it's a service the farmers avail, the cold chain is a service, to transact in Delhi. There's already a market in mind, not waiting and holding on. They don't have capacity to hold, but they can transact four days away or five days away for a 1,000% price wedge. Number two, even if I, as a cold chain provider, would buy the tomatoes off them and I connect with a distant market, the market radius has changed. It's no longer 100 kilometers around production area, but 1,000 kilometers. Bangalore to Delhi is 2,500 kilometers. Hence, demand gets linked with farm gate. Even I as a buyer or you as a buyer would buy more. One more example, if I have two seconds. Uh, go and look up an actual demonstration, like a living lab that we did with Kinu. You're aware Kinu is only sold in North India for uh, till about mid-February usually around 15, 18 rupees a kilo. That was it. Kinu was not even harvested. It, was, it would uh, be a loss on trees. By connecting them over four months through pre-cooling, packaging, it went from uh, Aboha to uh, Bangalore. Uh, the 17, 20 rupee Kinu was sold for 105 rupees at peak, weighted average of 55 rupees. The cold chain cost was only 10 and a half rupees per kilo and uh, all the more so, the carbon footprint of the entire system came down by 16%. The losses came down 70%, income went up 10 times, and in this period, and I, we did this about three years ago, in this period, uh, there are 1,300 reefer transport vehicles now regularly utilized out of Abaho, where people were wondering what to do. So don't look at cold chain about a technology for preserving and holding, abiding, uh, biding for a market to develop. It's there is a market somewhere. Connect with it, better cash flows, greater market footprint, demand gets communicated back to farm. The fork to farm approach will happen only when you look at connectivity, not sit on it. Thank you. Uh, excellent first question. Thank you very much. There's a question in the middle at the back, please. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, you know, we've been harping about this for years, the losses in PDS and the agricultural produce getting lost, loss of export opportunities because we don't have the right uh, cold chain infrastructure. What, and my question is maybe more directed to Mr. Kohli, what actually is preventing private investment as well as the government to step up and tackle this problem? It needs, by nature, there has to be a combination of both private uh, investment and, you know, governments like Haryana, which are stepping up. Um, why aren't we seeing the likes of Reliances and Tata's heavily invest in this? Because there is an issue, right? Because if they take up a patch and they invest there, you know, the, the connectivity with other areas hampers their return. So you need an aggregated view on this whole cold chain infrastructure. And it, so my question is, what is the main issue which is preventing, you know, both the private players from really ramping up this whole thing and the government. And secondly, do you see a role for smaller entrepreneurs actually cracking in into these spaces? What role can they play? Thank you. Uh, Pyronex, if we can start with you, but Mahesh, I'll then bring you in because you spoke a little bit, didn't you, about investor appetite uh, that, that, that you've seen and, and maybe Dr. Saini as well, but Pyronex first. One, it's a misnomer that there is uh, no investment. Uh, 
Yep. So India has the world's largest footprint in, uh, in uh, refrigerated warehousing space, 135 million cubic meters of space. Uh, China has only about 70 million cubic meters of such space. Most of the investment, 97% of this investment, has happened in the hands of private investors. Number two, you spoke about PDS. PDS doesn't involve perishables. However, a uh, very relevant question that uh, our export opportunities get uh, detracted because I go back to my initial statement, most of the investment sadly happened in uh, holding and, and warehousing space. So the new drive is now uh, in the preconditioning part because only when you prepare to travel can you travel distances. Uh, we've been typically dumping goods in uh, uh, warehouses and like I said, waiting for time, waiting for the price. Now it's about packaging and moving to where price exists. So that is changing. Uh, about Reliance and others, we'll have it offline. I'll tell you why, why and where it, it messed up. But however, there is a lot of, uh, uh, lot of investment happening. We have the world's largest market when it comes to milk. It's a $60 billion trade. We've done phenomenally, highly perishable. We are the world's top five uh, exporters of grapes, highly pe perishable, cold chain. We're the world's largest exporters of beef. Uh, we're doing it. It did uh, not take off where we want to move now in, in fruits and vegetables because largely fruits and vegetables, the consumption base was closed by to farms. These models have been developed and there are a lot of business models happening there and a lot of private investment and young entrepreneurs and startups are coming into the space. Uh, it'll carry on. I'll, I'll share a lot with you later. All right. So very quickly, as Mr. Kohli mentioned, there is a lot of uh, uh, startups that are coming into this space. And uh, here, uh, one particular thing that I would like to mention is right from market, that is the fork, up to the farm, and that too, going right up to the agri-water productivity. There are several startups that are giving climate advisories and also input uh, uh, know-how and knowledge base, so and so forth, uh, so that you have higher productivity on farm. At the same time, uh, uh, you actually sort of uh, get the uh, produce to the marketplace using mobile technologies. So uh, banks like Yes Bank, Rabobank, Nabar has a lot of funds, uh, uh, and there are several uh, investors uh, who are also in, uh, interested in this space. Uh, there was an investor summit that happened last year in Mumbai, and uh, several investors from Israel, UK, US, and so forth were deeply interested in this particular space. There is a specific role for smaller entrepreneurs as well, by forming some special purpose vehicles with the farmer producer companies and farmer producer organizations. Thank you. Um, with respect to the small startups, I think yesterday we've been into the tech awards where there is quite a number of people won prizes for data management, for smart technologies, and etc. And these technologies are important for enhancing connectivities from farmers to producers to consumers. They can be used effectively to manage cooling systems, whether in the cool packs or the, how, the storage or during the vehicle's uh, transport of these. And hence, they can enhance running the operation of these systems. While we don't maybe, or India maybe doesn't need large amount of uh, uh, setting up lo uh, lots of storage technologies on board, but if they can be managed more effectively, then they can uh, enhance the technology, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Um, any further questions? One at the back here. Thank you. Okay, as discussed uh, about the storage of goods of farmers in clusters or in storage stations. But the current scenario is that uh, the farmer want to sell his uh, goods or crops as soon as he harvested because of the financial reasons and because of his sustenance. So how will this storage system will work out? Dr. Saini, would you uh, happy to go first and then? Uh, yes. Uh, the main problem of the farmers, they are small and marginal farmers. And uh, especially the fruits and vegetables, they come in phases. Uh, and if there is a produce of a little quantity, then they have to sell their produce on a routine basis. Uh, naturally, they directly go into the market and sell whatever the price they get. But when, uh, when we are talking about the aggregation, this is aggregation not only the farmers, but aggregation of the produce also. When we are going to develop these infrastructures, 
uh, I don't think the private uh, investors can do that at the own farm systems, at the, at the farmer's field, because they require a huge investment by the private, and the managing of these infrastructure itself is an issue for them. Uh, that's why the government of India has come with a noble, light, noble scheme, not with different scheme, like the Sampada Yojana and other uh, global cluster schemes. And what they are proposing is uh, to have investment, to give direct investment to the farmers, FPOs. Once the aggregation is come, they can hold that produce uh, to a greater extent of period, depending on the, of course, the fruits and vegetables, the type of fruits you are dealing with. Then the investment, 90% uh, investment is the government is uh, you know, holding in that. Uh, but uh, government is also giving fund as a venture capital to manage uh, to day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day operation management. I think, uh, of course, it requires a longer period of time to sustain this, tech, uh, this uh, type of model. Uh, but within a three years hand-holding of the government, it really, it really works and the farmers, after uh, they become self-sufficient, after three years period, I think they will work it out. This is what we are thinking of. You started off with the fact that the farmers can't hold on because they don't know when the market will be there next. There's a time, there's a, but if you know there's a market three days away, they can hold on. What uh, Dr. Seni was speaking about, when you create farmer producer organizations, that's one is to club the farmers together. Second thing is to create these aggregation points. Remember, we have a lot of markets in the country. We have 7,500 APMC, so on and so forth, which were called assembly points for people to come an inheritance from uh, previous years. Now we're talking about aggregation hubs. Fragmented farms is not the issue. Fragmented output is the issue. So they aggregate the fragmented output. The farmers can direct uh, their, their produce, even if it is uh, aggregated together out of small lots, to a, another market for three, four, five, or seven days further. As that capacity, as that transaction brings about better incomes, they can also hold on for a nearby market. But like anyone in business, Faster cash flows, ready markets is far, far better. We only developed a holding mechanism because the infrastructure we created was on land, which meant a landed person with a certain capacity to retain funds. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, the country has only 450 pack houses, right? And we need 70,000 of those, which would mean one in every 10 villages. Hmm? Uh, in this previous budget, it was announced that 22,000 grams, which are preconditioning pack house systems, are to be developed. 22,000 from a current status of only 450. So enabling, empowering farmers to connect with markets is the whole idea, the whole essence, and hence build their capacity to take risk. The risk being either wait for a market, don't know what price, don't know when, or there is a market there. It's only a matter of two, three, four, or even 20 days away. But that's the price I will fed for it, given this particular quality. So those are the systems that need to be developed. Yeah. Very quickly, uh, we cannot really look at uh, the agribusiness uh, on its own. Uh, we have to look, look at the rural economy. And here is something which is my personal opinion. All of this that we're talking about is actually going to create some reverse migration and huge opportunities even for other types of rural industries. To give an example, uh, 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 Dr. Aldea uh, talked about different types of closed loop systems and technologies. Now, if you have some other type of waste heat available or waste cool that's available, you can actually enhance uh, the vaccine uh, storage. You can enhance different types of uh, other technologies and other businesses that can evolve. So I would recommend all of us to not really look at farm produce as the only income opportunity. There are several other income opportunities in the rural economy, and this is a trigger to stop the migration towards the urban cities. And in fact, my hope and opinion is that we actually will have the reverse migration from the cities to the rural economy. I think we have time for one or two other questions. Thank you, Jonathan. So I'm Jonathan Snape from the James Hutton Institute in Scotland. Uh, I was very interested in your talk. I learned a lot, especially about the, the new technologies that are being deployed for using renewable energy to, to power these systems. I was wondering though if the panel had any comments to make on the experience they had of 
uh, collaborating with crop scientists to understand better the material that you're thinking of putting into these uh, supply chains because they're not all the same. Uh, the different fruits and vegetables have different requirements for, for the optimum temperature. Uh, and an example in the UK is that one of the major multiple retailers increased the temperature by two degrees in which they were transporting strawberries, which led to a huge increase in, uh, or huge decrease in the, in the cost and, and an increase in their environmental performance. So I think there's a danger that if you don't understand the crop that you're transporting, you could be over-engineering the solution. And sometimes it doesn't have to be that cold. It also depends on the supply chain and how many days you're planning on, on keeping the crop. Uh, so I think you need to bear that in mind when you're designing solutions. The other point I want to make is actually in the supply chain, a lot of the losses are not due just to the temperature, but to physical damage. So if you're transporting crops long distances in trucks, uh, the physical damage from bouncing the crops around the, the bumpy roads can lead to significant losses, however good your coal supply chain is. That's, that's the case in the UK, and I'm sure it'll be as equally as bad, if not worse, in India. So how you actually package the crops into those systems, how you look after them, these are living organisms, they will change, even at low temperatures, they are changing all the time. So I said, do you have any experience of working with crop scientists so you can better understand these issues? Uh, and if you're not, I'd be happy to talk to you about it in the future. So it's both a, both a question and an offer, so uh, I, I like that. Uh, Panix, would you like to go first? Uh, operators, people, even farmers are very well aware of uh, these facts you said, they are even more so. It's also uh, not just uh, the packaging, Pack you can't move without packaging. It's also at what point you evacuate from your first stage preconditioning or holding. Uh, when a crop is fresh, it's turgid, it's full of water, it can withstand road dynamics. If I take out tomatoes after 10 days and despite it having a certain holding life or marketable life, it will not. Uh, hence we say cold chain is about fast, rapid evacuation, connect with markets, store close to markets and uh, do last mile deliveries. It's also a factor of, uh, uh, like you said, uh, uh, the supply chain, which basically you cool to buy time and how much time do you need? So there are different examples where these are deployed. Uh, uh, India is one of the largest producers of lychee. Optimally, scientists will tell you it's four degrees is the optimal temperature, but that optimal temperature buys you 14, 18 days. But if I have to move lychee from Bihar to Delhi, I can keep it at eight or 10 degrees and move it with tomatoes. So all that is matter of operations, standard operating procedures. There's also another factor people forget. When you, uh, in the supply chain, in the logistics trade, you do follow the stuffing principle. You have very bare minimal broken storage in a container or a truck or whatever, uh, over time, uh, these breathe away all the oxygen inside and they suffocate in their own CO2s. So the technology also has to cater for the fact that you will allow a little amount of oxygen to come in, like every car has a small ventilation thing. These are facts well known and we would always love to uh, interact more with uh, more people who are in the know. Uh, it's largely, I said, about actually demonstrating, uh, reaching out to people. The knowledge and the technologies have to be plugged in together keeping all these overviews in mind. Time is against us, I'm afraid, so I'm going to bring the, the, the session to a close. I, I, I won't attempt to summarize, but I will put one more question on the table, which I, I think we touched on from time to time, but I think is still open. And actually, it was one of the early challenges in the session, which is uh, I'm a social scientist. Um, and I'm always in, interested both in markets because I'm an economist, but also in behavior and mindset. So the challenge is you may have the greatest technology and you may have joined up systems, but actually how do you change the behavior of both farmers, consumers, and policymakers? Um, so I leave that as an open question. One thing that I would like you to join me though is giving thanks to four excellent panelists for a really interesting discussion. Thank you. And if I could remind you, please, to return your headphones to the tree uh, and don't switch them off. Thank you all for joining what was a really interesting session. Thank you.